Looking ahead. Challenges and opportunities in the changing world. Welcome to Talking Economics, a podcast by the Center for Economic Research and Graduate Education, Economics Institute. The Central and Eastern European region has undergone significant socioeconomic transformation following the fall of communism in the late 80s and early 90s and its consequent European Union accession. What are the main challenges for the region economies now with respect to the current changes in the world? In today's episode, we will discuss insights on the economic performance of the Central and Eastern European region with Katarina Rentarevska. Katarina is a Sergii alumna and the chief CE macroanalyst at Erste Group in Vienna. At Erste Group's research team, she analyzes and comments on macroeconomic developments in the CE region with a focus on the regional view uh, and cross-country analysis. Welcome, Kasia. So, uh, Kasia, uh, at first I would like you to maybe explain uh, the focus of your work or uh, the scope of the work. And I would like to ask you to define the region because C is a is a broad uh, definition. So if you could specify maybe closer, which countries are you working with? At Thursday Bank, um, we define our region as C8. Uh, so uh, these are the Visegrad countries, the Visegrad 4, Poland, Czechia, Slovakia, uh, and Hungary. Uh, but also we include analysis uh, about Romania and we cover some countries like Croatia. Uh, in our Zagreb office, uh, our analysts also take a look Uh, even at at Montenegro or Bosnia and Herzegovina. So this is uh, how we think about uh, about the region. Uh, Mostly um, we look at the macroeconomic developments, how the countries perform um, year on year basis. So the economic growth, uh, the inflation that has become a really important and uh, hot topic most recently. But we also go beyond this as uh, we uh, take a look at the structure of the economies, uh, about the convergence, about the underlying issues uh, that are challenges for these economies, but also uh, we take a look uh, at, uh, at, at these things uh, that, that, that go well. Perfect. And these are exactly the things that I would like to hear more about. Uh, usually we perceive quite a lot of differences among our countries, right? Czechia is very different from Slovakia in many ways and, and Poland and everything. So could you maybe highlight the common aspects and the, the, the convergence? Are we converging or are, are we still very heterogeneous or what are the trends? What is the status? So uh, despite the fact that we look at all these countries as the region itself, the countries within the region remain very, very heterogeneous. Um, Starting with the convergence that you mentioned, uh, the pace of convergence has been uh, very much different. Uh, Most recently on social media, there is quite a popular map showing by how much real GDP has changed um, in Europe versus US. And obviously our region is is highlighted uh, with uh, Poland uh, being the leader, uh, growing more than 170% uh, from 1995. Um, Obviously with with Czechia or Slovakia uh, having a uh, more slower pace, but that's also related to their starting point, right? So Czechia and Slovakia uh, were in a different place also in 1990. Um, Particularly Czechia was much richer and therefore naturally the pace of convergence is slower. Uh, This is also something what we have been seeing that uh, uh, the catching up process has naturally slows. It's still present. the countries in the region still grow faster than the Eurozone, uh, but in general, the pace of conversion has been slowing, which is exactly according to all the economic textbooks. So if you look at it from that perspective. Mm-hmm. 
And you say that the countries are still remaining very heterogeneous. So uh, what are the main differences, would you say, or what, are there some commonalities that we can uh, look at or that you observe? So looking at the common things, um, all of the countries in the region um, joined the European Union. Uh, they deepened their integration. However, the pace of the integration is very much uh, different. Slovakia is already uh, in Eurozone uh, for more than a decade. Croatia just joined uh, the Eurozone. On the other hand, uh, Czech Republic or Poland uh, are nowhere close uh, to go that, uh, that way. Uh, and as mentioned, uh, the economy uh, itself has a very different structure. When you take a look at the uh, Czech Republic, Slovakia or Hungary, these are very small open uh, economies, uh, export oriented. When you take a look at Poland and Romania, uh, these are much bigger countries uh, with uh, much bigger um, uh, internal market, uh, so uh, export import do not play uh, uh, as big role as in case of uh, Slovakia or Czechia, uh, but the growth drivers uh, are are different. So uh, the structure of the economies also um, are related to how. Um, uh, well or not well uh, countries do during shocks or crisis and how uh, how they are affected so uh, it's all connected on the one hand uh, the region is part of uh, European Union and obviously uh, the, the integration takes place, but on the other hand, the structure of the economies are sometimes um, so distinctive uh, that allow for, for a different performance. So even looking back to 2009, uh, Poland was called the Green Island back then. It was the only country that avoided the recession session while Slovakia or Czechia were were hit uh, much uh, more. Okay, uh, thank you. You talked about the structure and uh, how these countries have different responses or uh, how, uh, how they react differently to crisis, which is exactly what uh, we are going through, right? We've been through turbulent times first uh, the pandemic uh, and now we have the war in Ukraine which is right at our borders. So uh, how is our region uh, dealing with these challenges? Uh, well, uh, the recent uh, couple of years uh, were indeed uh, a very <laughs> challenging and unexpected event happened. So first the pandemic, um, and I believe uh, no country in the world was prepared for that. And once the pandemic ended and it already seemed that the economies um, started to recover and uh, get a good pace of, of growth and the optimism was growing, uh, the war in uh, Ukraine uh, um, uh, began. Uh, so uh, there is a crisis after the crisis. Uh, obviously, uh, giving the proximity to the Ukraine, Poland, Slovakia uh, or Czechia uh, are also differently impacted than the Western countries. Uh, so from that perspective, uh, already when we look at the flow of migrants, uh, this has been a, a, a huge challenge uh, in front of Poland, Slovakia, but also uh, Czechia um, welcomed a very high share of their population of uh, Ukraine migrants. Uh, so um, this is something what particularly touches uh, our region, uh, uh, the economies in the region, uh, obviously bringing both uh, benefits and challenges. Uh, 
benefits, uh, we can recognize the impact, uh, the positive impact uh, from flow of uh, uh, Ukraine migrants on the labor market. Um, on the other hand, uh, the challenges uh, related uh, to their integration to the economies, uh, to the education system or to the healthcare system may only highlight the already existing problems within these sectors, within these uh, economies. And can you tell us more about how, how our various countries are succeeding or failing in uh, addressing these challenges? Are there some countries which were better in, uh, you know, working with uh, the migrants and and working with uh, responding to the fact that we lost or stopped uh, using the uh, natural resources from Russia? So, uh in terms of, uh, let's say, uh, Ukrainian uh, uh, migrants or refugees, uh, Poland uh, was most exposed at the beginning uh, as um, they faced a huge flow uh, of people that needed to be accommodated. Uh, they obviously moved far farther, for example, uh, to Czechia. Uh, all of these countries, I believe, uh, tackled quite well uh, the inflow of uh, of such amount of people. Uh, Poland uh, very quickly get them uh, the possibility to get the status of the of the citizen, so to get their personal number that obviously is needed for further uh, bureaucracy for finding uh, the work. Um, Poland is a uh, a huge market and um, they absorbed more than half a million of, of uh, Ukrainian workers um, and the unemployment rate uh, remained uh, uh, quite low. So that only shows uh, the need also uh, for the for the migrants and how can they support uh, uh, the economies. Uh, pretty much the same thing happened in in Czechia. Uh, Slovakia also made a, a relatively high flow of people, but not uh, not to that uh, extent. Uh, as for tackling um, other impact of of the war, um, when the war um, began, uh, obviously all the economic forecasts. Of, of economic growth of GDP were revised downward. Uh, there were huge worries that uh, the proximity of war will impact uh, mainly uh, the region, and that we will uh, see maybe a recession or a major slowdown. Um, these uh, worries has not materialized. Uh, the region um, performed very well. Uh, the countries kept growing throughout 2022, uh, which probably to some extent uh, could be seen as a surprising. Uh, but it's worth to remember that after the COVID, the economies uh, were speeding up in the recovery process and also uh, people were were hungry for utilizing services and something what they were bent to do for for roughly two years uh, so that definitely uh, was a positive factor helping uh, to overcome the the impact of war uh, the flow of migrants uh, also impacted uh, private consumption and, and, and retail sales performance. These were not only refugees uh, uh, who just came to the country and 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 needed uh, to buy food or uh, basic stuff. It's also the help that uh, people in Poland or in Czechia or in Slovakia provided uh, to the Ukraine. Uh, so that was kind of a positive uh, surprise. Uh, effect. Uh, I believe that the major <laughs> negative surprise is that the inflation surged so incredibly. And here, if we are thinking about the region, um, the region began with monetary tightening much, much sooner than the Western economies. Uh, so they were very prompt and very aggressive. Uh, it has obviously uh, 
positives and, and negative side of that. Uh, positive is that uh, the approach uh, to tackle the surging inflation um, was very was very prompt. Uh, on the other hand, obviously, uh, the high interest rates and high inflation environment impacted the households, and obviously, uh, the low income families uh, the most. Uh, so here, the countries also responded in a different way with different programs, but uh, many of the governments proposed uh, uh, packages that helped to tackle the high energy costs, uh, that provided support to companies. Um, Hungary was here an exception because uh, they uh, quite early introduced uh, the uh, price caps uh, for example, for um, fuel. Um, on the one hand, it helped them to keep the inflation low at the beginning and uh, the costs uh, were quite uh, low, uh, but it backfired uh, as at one point when they needed to finally uh, release uh, the caps, uh, the inflation um, surged even higher. So, um, as in every situation, as in every crisis, um, some outcomes can be predictable uh, and uh, some or part of the impact uh, cannot be fully associated, uh, especially uh, Russia used uh, the gas and oil import as a negotiation technique. Uh, so, um, it impacted the energy prices, uh, it impacted also the food prices, um, as Ukraine uh, is, is a major exporter uh, of grains, for example, uh, and we all pay the, uh, the price. Here, maybe I can also mention that sea region is uh, impacted to a much greater extent than the Western uh, economies, uh, especially if we look at the uh, food inflation. Uh, it is much, much higher compared to the Western countries. Uh, so um, the impact, uh, particularly in that area, uh, is felt uh, to much a great extent in the region than uh, in the rest of the Europe. Mm -hmm. I would like to go back to the question of energy prices, because uh, when the war started and uh, the prices uh, jumped uh, so incredibly, uh, there were a lot of fears about the uh, and the expectations of the impact, and uh, the predictions were very bleak. Um, so what would you say now about uh, the developments? Because it seems that the predictions actually didn't uh, turn out exactly as it looked like, which is great, of course. Uh, well, uh, the energy prices in particular, like electricity prices, uh, skyrocketed in the summer. Um, and this was combination of factors. Uh, it was not only uh, the impact of, of, of the war or the limited gas supply. It was also uh, the impact of uh, uh, weather, of the climate uh, conditions. Uh, in particular here, the trouble uh, in France uh, when the, the rivers dried and the nuclear power plants needed the water to cool down the reactors uh, and then not enough power was generated then obviously when the supply is limited the price goes uh, up so um, that was uh, also uh, unfortunate uh, combination of of of, uh, of the factors um, at the top of that there were growing worries um, and uncertainty driving the price up, how the Europe will survive the winter uh, if Russia stops uh, the gas uh, uh, supplies, um, whether there will be a major recession. Uh, so uh, 
the storage was was built uh, European Union um, as a whole responded and set the limit uh, and the timing um, by when uh, the storages must be full uh, on the other hand uh, there was also a saving uh, on the uh, gas consumption uh, so uh, we could see that Obviously, it's not only in the region, but across the Europe uh, that uh, uh, countries complied with the reduction of, of gas consumption requirement. And that obviously helped to keep the storage relatively uh, high and full. And once uh, the worries and uncertainty um, faded, and it was pretty clear that uh, Europe uh, will most likely even avoid the recession. Um, the weather conditions uh, changed. Um, then uh, the gas and the electricity prices went substantially down and they are at the very low and actually uh, pre-war uh, level uh, already. Um, uh, at the beginning of the year. So uh, this is something what allows us to expect that the situation at the uh, inflation front, if I may call it that way, uh, will stabilize this year. That will help inflation to go down uh, and um, to improve also um, the the conditions and the expectations of, of households and of the economies. Here, yeah, speaking about the inflation, uh, there are two countries uh, in, no, three countries in your region, which uh, have euro, right? So uh, their monetary policy is, say, limited. Uh, do you see any differences in uh, the uh, addressing the inflation uh, between the countries which do have euro uh, and the the ones that have their own currencies? Um, yes, so the biggest difference is that um, Czechia, Poland and Hungary began with monetary tightening much, much earlier uh, than uh, uh, Eurozone. Uh, obviously, Slovakia back then, Croatia was not uh, in the Eurozone uh, in 2022 yet. Uh, so Slovakia and Slovenia uh, were obviously dependent on the uh, ECB um, decisions. So the, the monetary tightening uh, came uh, much uh, later. Uh, so um, on one hand, uh, these countries that have a, a flexible exchange rate and independent uh, monetary authorities uh, could react to the situation um, much earlier and they could design the response, particularly to the conditions that they see in the country. Uh, we have to remember that the exchange rate uh, development also plays a role and is a factor that central banks uh, consider. Uh, maybe they do not impact the exchange rates in a direct way, but definitely they take a look at the at the development. And here the best example is Hungary uh, with a Hungarian foreign uh, that depreciated um, quite substantially last year and it has been depreciating very fast in the autumn. It made Hungarian Central Bank to respond with an emergency rate hike, putting uh, the interest rate as high as 18%. So um, they, they are more flexible to react to the changing uh, conditions that uh, those countries that are in the uh, Eurozone where the uh, European Central Bank undertakes the decision. Mm -hmm. And were these policies effective? So did the uh, independent uh, policies manage to curb the inflation? Uh, in in a more effective way than uh, the countries which were members of the Eurozone, Slovakia and Slovenia at the time we were speaking? 
Uh, so um, it's it's hard to evaluate because uh, these countries have also different conditions and because different factors also play the role. For example, the, the food inflation that they mentioned is much higher in the whole region uh, than it is in the Eurozone. So um, obviously the European Central Bank policy uh, has one policy and it has to fit all. So it is definitely more difficult to have one policy to fit all very much different countries than having independent monetary authorities that have to fit only one particular uh, country. Um, surprisingly, uh, the inflation uh, is much lower in uh, Western um, Europe. Uh, so they, they do not face as high and has double digit uh, inflation dynamics as the region was facing uh, in the second half of, uh, of the year. Um, it is though hard to tie it only to the monetary policy response. I will I will leave it yeah I will leave it that way uh, it it I mean it's it goes also like you know a bit uh, political that's a side comment obviously uh, so uh, uh, but it's also hard to enhance there are now we can we can maybe use uh, that word that it's hard to evaluate because for example food inflation was much more dynamic for the for the region so the inflation is higher here. Uh, also, this happens uh, because there is a different structure of the inflation baskets. Um, in a kind of natural way, the, the region, the countries in the region uh, are also like poorer than the Western economies. So uh, the share of the um, consumption basket spent on the food items is much, uh, uh, is much bigger also. So the for example, the food inflation is something what particularly distinct is distinctive between the region and the, the, the Western uh, economies. So in that terms, the prompt response of, of uh, independent monetary authorities could be more effective than, for example, as opposed to, uh, to, to Slovakia, uh, which depends on, on a European Central Bank decision and faces the uh, dynamics of food inflation the same uh, as the region. But the problem is very complex. It's only one factor. These are not all the factors uh, that can can uh, can outweigh the, uh, the effects of monetary policies. You understand I'm uh, in the Czech Republic, right? And the discussion about the euro adoption has been eternal. Uh, and um, and now it seems that it's, uh, it's actually providing additional arguments for staying with uh, staying independent. But um, yes, I, I wanted to hear if uh, how did Slovakia handle uh, these things and uh, if we maybe can go uh, a little um, broader or, or take the question in a more general way. Slovakia adopted Euro in uh, 2009, right? So five years after entering the European Union, they adopted the Euro. We've had, well, nearly 15 years of, uh, of history here. So are there any analysis that would say, okay, here are strong economic reasons for adopting the euro and we can see at the case of Slovakia that it was a wise decision or what would be the assessment? Uh, well, first of all, let me underline that um, having a euro being a part of a eurozone is a purely political decision obviously it is tied to the performance of the economies first countries need to make so uh, called maastricht criteria so uh, at this point with inflation uh, going uh, close to 20 percent uh, probably uh, Czechia, Poland or Hungary will not even uh, meet um, the, the Maastricht uh, criteria. Uh, the 
the public debt and and deficit figures uh, also suffered during the pandemic. Uh, so um, uh, first, uh, you need uh, you need also to take a look uh, at that. Uh, once uh, you meet the, the the Maastricht criteria, you also have to then follow the the period of uh, fixing the exchange rate. So it's quite a lengthy process, uh, but. Uh, at the beginning and maybe also at the end of that, uh, there is a need for a political will and a political decision um, that uh, this is the path the country wants uh, wants to take. As the case of uh, Croatia, uh, that was uh, quite fast in adopting uh, Euro. Um, it joined in January 2023 uh, with becoming a um, member of European Union, European Union much later than um, Visegrad 4, for example. Uh, the decision, the decision is always complicated because it's have its cost uh, um, and benefits. We have been talking about the independent monetary policy and uh, how it's different compared to the ECB. So this is something what the countries uh, need to give up uh, when they become the part of uh, uh, Eurozone. Uh, they um, give up the flexible exchange rate that uh, may be seen as, as an effective uh, channel, uh, also a channel uh, helping uh, to reach the, the goals of uh, monetary authorities. And here let's uh, come back to Czech Republic uh, that uh, was using unconventional um, exchange rate uh, floor uh, to back then come out or help the country to fight uh, deflationary pressures. Uh, so uh, the decision uh, needs to be taken overall. Uh, obviously, there are fears related to adopting the Eurozone, and probably the biggest fear is, is, is the inflation. <laughs> Um, so now when we take a look at, at, at Croatia in this couple of months, uh, even in, in the environment or the, the latest uh, surging inflation numbers, uh, Croatia did not um, do worse than other countries. Um, on the contrary, at the beginning of the year, uh, the inflationary pressure have been easing. Mm -hmm. um, as, for the, as for the evaluation of, of the impact of, of adoption euro in, in Slovakia, here um, we haven't done the analysis ourselves. So um, I believe, strongly believe that the best uh, is to relate to um, uh, Institute of Financial Policy in Slovakia. They have done the assessment uh, using um, uh, a model, a synthetic control, uh, when they try to mimic how the Slovak uh, economy would develop if it wouldn't adopt the euro. And uh, when the analysis was done, the message was uh, quite uh, clear and quite positive that Slovakia uh, did much better uh, with uh, uh, common currency. Um, obviously, it also depends probably on the time of the adoption, um, how, how uh, the country uh, performed, uh, whether the external factors were favorable uh, or not. So uh, this is complex decision and uh, belongs to politics. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, we've talked quite a lot about the challenges of the region and many things that we're, we're facing. Uh, and we are running out of time. So so I would like to conclude uh, with Kasia, if, to, to balance it out, if you see any opportunities in the future. So speaking about uh, what you see as the opportunities in, in the region. We usually say that the challenges can be also an opportunity, right? So do you see any opportunities with the labor market, for example? 
it, this is exactly where 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 I'm 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 a bit heading uh, to, and uh, um, obviously uh, the, the pandemic uh, and the the war are very extraordinary event, uh, and uh, we are living in in the extraordinary times. But as you mentioned, these challenges uh, bring uh, probably some opportunities. So. Um, with the latest outbreak of the war and the flow of migrants, um, I am quite strongly convinced and believe uh, that the the flow of migrants is positive for the labor markets in the in the region. Um, the region um, faces the aging uh, population. So the working population has been shrinking and it will be shrinking. We cannot uh, avoid that. Uh, so the flow of migrants definitely helps the labor market. Uh, for example, in a better matching. So there are, um, uh, there are jobs that are filled uh, with uh, uh, Ukrainian uh, refugees uh, that uh, was not that easy uh, to look for an employees uh, within the, the country's population. Um, the other definitely challenge uh, that uh, not only the region, but the whole Europe faces about the region in particular uh, is also an energy transition. Um, so um, I think that we can uh, at this point assess that uh, the Europe was a bit lucky, but also managed the situation well with, with the limited supply of, of gas from Russia. Uh, it found different resources, it limited the consumption, but the the need for the energy transition for the shift uh, to use more uh, renewables couldn't be much obvious or much clearer than it is it is now uh, it is already happening um it will definitely uh, speed up in the years to come uh, it provides independence it provides uh, diversity and the CE region also faces a great opportunity in using the European funds to go through that transition uh, as smoothly as, as possible. Uh, Poland is greatly dependent on, on the coal. Uh, so um, it is also a unique opportunity uh, probably to um, to force some, some changes or maybe introduce the reforms that are not that popular or painful to the society, um, but also help them to go through these reforms and through that substantial change with European funds. Perfect, Kasia, thank you. Uh, thank you for all your insights. I think we could be talking for another hour, but the time is really up. So thank you for, for being with us and sharing your insights. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Uh, it was a great pleasure.